Always look him in the eye. Nothing sells like sincerity. The opening scene of Oliver Stone's Nixon finds the Watergate burglars preparing for their mission while watching a training film about how to be a good salesman. Though seemingly random, it hints at what's to come, an epic biography about a man of substance who is uncomfortable in his own skin, enslaved by influences and impulses that his repressive conditioning wouldn't permit him to investigate. A sprawling amalgam of death of a salesman, Citizen Kane, Freudian psychoanalysis, and 50 years worth of headlines and transcripts, Nixon feels less like a biography than an autobiography, colored by Nixon's paranoia and self-loathing. We have peace with honor. I ended the war. I got out one with the Russians. I opened China. So why are these assholes turning on me? Because they don't like the way I look. They don't like where I went to school. Because they're not Americans. Yeah, right. They don't trust. They don't trust America. It was assumed that Stone, a counterculture provocateur whose Vietnam service coincided with Nixon's rise to the presidency, would skewer the man as a panderer to red state reactionaries, someone who pursued power for power's sake and an enabler and exemplar of the military-industrial complex whose presence hovers over so much of Stone's filmography. This is peace all you're interested in. The real war is in us. The history is a symptom of our disease. Yet the movie is no hit job. Consider the sequence that follows Nixon's strangely psychoanalytical China trip with a harshly editorializing account of the Christmas bombing of Hanoi that no early 70s broadcast news outlet would ever allow. It is without doubt the most brutal bombing in American history. Newspapers are calling it a Stone Age tactic. And Nixon a bad tyrant. Nixon's response, when the Vietnamese take the Paris peace talk seriously, I'll stop. This newscast, like all the newscasts in the movie, indeed, like the whole of Nixon, is not supposed to be taken as a straight recreation of reality. The media that intrude upon the film's narrative are colored by Nixon's self-perception. When he reads a newspaper or watches TV, he and we aren't seeing what the world thinks of Nixon, but what Nixon thinks the world thinks of Nixon. Nixon's mind is a Freudian stew of incompatible ingredients. There are idealized flashbacks to his Quaker upbringing, showing how he idolized his older brother and mother and feared his disciplinarian father. We sense that Nixon absorbed their prejudices, aspired to their clarity, and remembered their admonition to never give up no matter what. Struggle's what gives life meaning, not victory, struggle. When you quit struggling, they beat you. And then you end up in the street with your hand out. The premature death of Nixon's older brother is conflated in Nixon's imagination with the killing of JFK, a man whose movie star quality seemed a reproach to Nixon's very existence. Stone theorizes that the 18 minutes that Nixon removed from his White House tapes confirmed Nixon's role in the creation of a national security state, something he endorsed for patriotic reasons, but which grew out of control, killing JFK and subjecting America to the trauma he felt at losing his brother. What do you think? I never said this, though. Seven times, ten times. Ten times. What do you think people like that? No. They just gave up? The gap is Nixon's own rosebud. But Stone, to his credit, leaves its meaning as mysterious and irreducible as that of Charles Foster Kane's childhood sled. It is a pretext for free association, for fantasy, for Nixon's and Stone's dreams and nightmares of America. Nixon's taping himself, then claiming as he listens to the recordings that he never said this or that, and running the tape back as if to reverse and then re-record history is a microcosm of Stone's filmmaking approach. There's a gap between what Nixon said and did and what he wishes he said and did, between Nixon's aspirations to greatness and the verdicts of the media, the public, and history itself. The quote-unquote reality of Nixon's life is often overlaid with or interrupted by still photographs, headlines, or footage for newsreel or TV cameras. Sometimes these elements simply reduce Nixon's accomplishments to historical footnotes, as if Nixon is thinking, nobody will remember how long I worked to do this, only that it happened. We're inside Nixon's head as he tries to make a case for himself while trying and failing to suppress his fear that journalism, the first draft of history, has already diminished him through pop psychoanalysis, leftist posturing, and petty schoolyard cruelty. 
We can sense this in the section dealing with Nixon's role in the Alger Hiss case and other attempts to expose and expunge accused communists from government. Stone mixes recreated footage of Nixon justifying his actions, newsreel snippets suggesting the threat of communist aggression and fear of nuclear war, and another March of Time narrator pigeonholing Nixon as a demagogue whose supposedly selfless acts are driven by deep-seated, probably petty character flaws. I continue to expose the people that have sold this country down the river. His speeches, if more subtle than those of his Republican ally, Joe McCarthy, were just as aggressive. You know, you know, the direct result of Truman's decision is that China has gone communist. Follow us, monster. Why? Who in the State Department is watching over American interests? Who has given the Russians the atomic bomb? The Soviet Union is an example of the slave state in the husband development. Driven by demons that seemed more personal than political, Nixon became Eisenhower's vice presidential candidate in 1952. In the recreation of Nixon's 1960 presidential debate with John F. Kennedy, in which JFK's good looks, charisma, and TV makeup made his opponent look like a moist little troll, there's a moment where JFK uses information gleaned in a CIA briefing to attack the Eisenhower-Nixon administration's foreign policy. JFK knows that Nixon won't respond for fear of violating national security rules like he just did. At that moment, Nixon either remembers or flashes forward to JFK's inauguration, as if thinking, this is the moment when I lost the election. We might never have had Castro. Why didn't we? Mr. Nixon? Oh, man, he's treading water. Come on. All right, come on. Violated national security. Yeah, come on, attack the bastard. The Constitution of the United States, so help me God. Mr. Nixon? Yeah. Uh-huh. In the sequence following Nixon's defeat in the 1962 California governor's race, we enter the room with Nixon, then feel his depression and frustration as he gives what he mistakenly thinks will be his last public speech. As he talks, Stone cuts to newspaper reporters writing down Nixon's emotionally naked statements, and newsreel cameras seeking to frame Nixon as unflatteringly as possible, even zeroing in on his signature upper lip sweat. Uh, <clears throat> I believe Governor Brown has a heart even though he believes I do not. Uh, I believe he's a good American, even though he feels I am not. I'm proud of the fact that I defended my opponent's uh, patriotism. Uh, you gentlemen didn't report it, but I'm proud that I did that. And, and I would appreciate it for once, gentlemen, if you would just print what I say. And for 16 years, uh, Ever since the Hiss case, you've had a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun. But recognize you have a responsibility, if you're against the candidate, to give him the shaft. But if you do that, at least put one lonely reporter on the campaign and we'll report what the candidate says now and then. Uh, I think, all in all, I've given as good as I've taken. But as I leave you, I, I want you to know just think what you're going to be missing. Uh, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Kick around anymore. The essence of Stone's approach is telegraphed by an image in the movie's prologue, a slow tracking shot around a movie projector, ending with the bulb shining into the viewer's eyes. The entire film is a multi-plane projection. Nixon projecting his goals and fears onto America, and America returning the favor.